right, so I'm Caleb Jones, and um, this session is the nerdy title of it is the you can see on the screen here ontological normative strategic roles of the environment in the virtual world. So what I'm going to be exploring is here is what role do we does the environment play in virtual uh, environments, and particularly video games? Touching on that a bit, uh, and then offering some tools of how we might think about this. And then finally, uh, maybe touch on uh, what would a Mormon transhumanist uh, view of this look like? All right, so I'm not going to speak a lot to this, but just I think we're all aware of this, that uh, virtual worlds, particularly as uh, they're found in video games, is a major form of entertainment, and it's a, a very uh, largely growing form of entertainment. And so entertainment has the power to influence culture, uh, create culture, change culture. So I think this is something we want to think about uh, in terms of um, environmental rejuvenation, what we see the role in our relationship to environment being. So at a, at a high level, you can look at the environment in virtual worlds and video games as really a passive world or an active world. And I contrast a few traits uh, that they might have uh, where a passive world really forms a boundary or is merely acting as a resource to the player or the, uh, the person inside the world. Uh, tends to be transactional in its interactions. And often there's only a, 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 a kind of singular direct consequence. There's no secondary or indirect consequences that are modeled and play out in the world. Uh, and often the interactions can be pre-programmed. So things are scripted, closed, and, and deterministic. Um, where an active world would be the environment itself an actor within the world. Um, the degree of agency it has could be to vary, but it has the ability to act independent of the player's intent. Um, the interactions often create a feedback loop in our interactive worlds where the player does something uh, affects the environment, the environment does something that affects the player, and you have that, that uh, uh, feedback loop there. Um, there's secondary and tertiary consequences, sometimes uh, that aren't always, uh, that aren't mystic, uh, you know, uh, or, or um, more complex or less predictable. And then it, the interactions are dynamic. You can think of some games um, where the world is generative, where it's different each time. Uh, you know, Minecraft is a good example of that. Um, uh, no Man's Sky is another one. And stochastic in nature. So there's randomness that's involved in it. So this is at a high level how we might identify and understand whether we're operating in a passive world or an active world in a virtual environment. So I'm not going to read all of this, but there's a book uh, called Playing Nature, uh, Ecology and Video Games, written by um, Alenda uh, Chang. She's a um, professor of, I think, media studies uh, at UC Santa Barbara, she focuses on ecology. And uh, she contrasts some of the, she calls them hyper-capitalist tendencies in a lot of video games where the main goal is to level up and accumulate, and how that can lead to uh, certain behaviors that don't really encourage behave, um, attitudes and uh, subsequent behaviors that will uh, help us address environmental crises. But she doesn't feel like games and virtual worlds have to be that. She notes that you know games have their own natural system. She calls them uh, mesocosms, and that players could you know these games could teach players the gist of key ecological concepts, things like scale entropy, collapse, and things like that. And I'll give an example of that of a game that I grew up playing uh, that did exactly just that for me. But I want to touch on this. There's, there's some work, that, this great work that's been doing to explore this, this concept. So what I want to do as a tool is talk about frame analysis as a way to deconstruct some of the assumptions that go into worldviews and environments, and then briefly go through what these could look like and what they do look like in uh, different uh, popular are maybe some less popular and some forthcoming uh, games. And then end on a, what, what a Mormon transhumanist ecological frame might look like by looking at the transhumanist declaration and the Mormon uh, transhumanist um, uh, affirmation. So frame analysis, uh, I'm gonna go very high level here, but at the, its root, um, well, some, some uh, aspects to it that are core are ontological, normative, and strategic. So ontological things that they are, normative, what is good or bad, and strategic is what can or should we do. And this has been uh, you know, developed, uh, I forget the year on this book, but um, Frame Analysis, Essay on Organization Experience uh, by uh, Irving Goffman. 
is an early work there. But if in a single kind of word, uh, we're talking about facts and axioms, morals, and goals. And often they go from top to bottom there, right? Facts and axiom, axioms form the language for morals, and the language for morals forms the language or symbols for, for goals. So Minecraft, how, how might we frame this? Well, I actually got some of these, uh, at least for Minecraft, the idea of framing it. Uh, this, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this YouTube channel, like Stories of Old by uh, Tom Vanderlinden, but he actually did this work in constructing Minecraft and framing it. And so I'm going to touch on what he did here because I think it sets up uh, a great application of this tool. And so long story short, he goes through a lot of great examples. He feels that ontologically, a virtual environment like Minecraft is the world is ultimately indifferent to the player and exists for the player's manipulation. So an example, so this is actually uh, our own Jones family uh, Minecraft server that we've been running for five years. And these are a few screenshots out of it. And so we've made certain uh, decisions and in, in impacts. In fact, in the lower left-hand corner is an island with all the, like a lighthouse and a fountain and all these um, you know, different crops. I actually leveled that island. Uh, so I terraformed that island to produce that. I didn't get any bonus points for doing that. I didn't get any negative points for uprooting all the trees that were once on that. Uh, and so ultimately the environment is indifferent to some of our creations there. On, a, on, this, on this, another extreme, these are screenshots of another Minecraft world uh, uh, called oh, 2B2T. It's the, uh, the longest running the anarchy Minecraft? In, in Minecraft server. And so it is, this is screenshots and uh, top two uh, pictures are screenshots from its world spawn, which is for lack of a better phrase, a, a hellish landscape. And this is all done manually by the players. Um, and so, and then the lower right hand corner, and so at the bottom, you have walls that, and barriers that are put up to prevent new players from like, getting out of this, this landscape. Um, and so there's, but then in the lower right hand corner, you also have subsequent almost surges and, um, and riots that people will burst through those. And so it's an interesting uh, kind of uh, environment that's playing out with anarchy as the, as the, the subsequent uh, assumption underneath it. But ultimately, in either scenario, the world is indifferent, is acting as a passive resource. So this radical agency enters the normative layer. So morality is more informed by what, in my craft, by what it doesn't discourage the player from doing rather than what it encourages. And so an example would be um, food collection. And so these are a few screenshots of different uh, approaches to food production, that uh, extreme approaches. People have, so slaughterhouses have been created, um, both in terms of mass quantity, but also uh, pre-cooking the food, burning the livestock alive and things like that uh, is, is totally possible. And there's no negative points for doing that. Um, and the lower, lower images, the uh, YouTuber um, Muse Elk in a YouTube video he called uh, I Trapped 100 Villagers in Minecraft created a, a work camp for them to do all of his crop work for him. And that, that screenshot with him kind of lifting up his hands is in a moment of that video, he talks a little bit about, uh, you know, questions he has about the ethics of doing this. Uh, he doesn't, it's not a big, he doesn't want a big ethical discussion, but he gave him pause as he was doing this uh, in the game. So ultimately in the strategic layer, um, you get resources, you build shelter, you upgrade items, conquer, domesticate the world. Pretty standard. Uh, you think back to that, uh, the, the quote from the book previously. And the, uh, at, uh, like stories of old, he compares this to, be, and says it's very influenced by the post-World War II ecological frame. So nature is unaffected by human activity. We can treat nature as instrumental and we can extract resources, expand, build as much, uh, you know, without much concern for the environment. And he, I'll just read this real quick because I love how he talks about the potential that we're not quite, uh, that we aren't quite uh, tapping into. He says, the thing I really want to experience, want is to experience Minecraft like I did when I first started playing it. Exploring, discovering, not really knowing what I'm doing. There was an unmistakable charm to those early days in this virtual world of blocks. I would love to see a new mechanic to revitalize that feeling. I want to mess around in natural environments and find out what the consequences are. 
I want to learn about eco ecological cause and effect and utilize them to improve my base and the world around it. I want to feel the danger of new and unexpected environmental hazards, the joy of surprising opportunities, and the blissful sensation of after hours and hours of work, standing within your own creation, existing in peaceful harmony. And if those mechanics were to invoke you to reflect in our natural world and your own ecological impact, to make you question your worldview in a meaningful way, that to me sounds like a pretty great deal. So he doesn't say that Minecraft is broken, but that there are additional directions that it could be taken into uh, and he used that frame analysis to do so. So another one, and I'll go shorter on these, um, is I was thinking of Oregon Trail, but there's actually a really in interesting game called uh, When Rivers Were Trails. And um, it is it created by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation and collaboration with Michigan State University's Games for Entertainment Learning Lab. And also um, it includes the art, the artwork, um, writing and musician contributions from over 30 indigenous writers. Um, and so I played through this and it, it's interesting because you pick a tribe um, or clan and then you traverse the, the terrain and ultimately you're you're starting by being dislocated and collecting what you can you have well-being foods and medicines and as you go through this experience you have to balance those things out uh, and and survive um ontologically we could say you know you're the axioms or the foundation of this game or this environment is the tension between well-being from protection to your land or heritage and displacement from it. Um, and so as you go along, you get these warnings, you know, settlers are coming, allotment uh, assimilation you deal with, you encounter other indigenous people in similar circumstances, you exchange stories, you collect medicines, and you continue on uh, traversing the landscape here. Um, and so this hearing of stories is interesting because one of the meters that you keep up is called well-being. And as you engage with story exchange and trading uh, and even helping uh, groups with hunting and entering hunting parties and things, um, you, you increase in that well-being. And so that starts to form some of the morality uh, behind the environment and the, the, the player within that environment. And you get a lot of these, uh, you know, from a diversity, you know, trade and, and hearing stories, some positive stories, some negative stories, um, encountering, I think that person in the right hand corner, you, or you call a cousin, you know, uh, someone you haven't seen in a long time. Um, and so the, the strategy here is you journey through the land, you trade, join with this place, people, and ultimately uh, seek a new home. Uh, so that's a frame analysis of that game that we could, and, I, the thing about frame analysis, there's multiple ways you could frame things, right? The, I'm just offering a way to frame it. Um, there could be different lenses and, and frames that, that, that come at this from different angles. All right, so Sim Earth, and this I call my first transhumanist experience. Um, so this is a game that came out in 1990, and it essentially models Lovelock's um, uh, a Ga a Gaia hypothesis. Um, and Ontologically, it's, it's, it kind of sits here in this, this, this foundation that the natural biota collectively works to make the earth optimal or favorable for life. And so what you can actually do is start early on and just let the game run. And you'll see in the lower left-hand corner that you can pull up these different charts and see how the air, the biosphere, the uh, air temperature, sea temperature fluctuate and affect one another. Um, essentially, what they've coded up is more of a, if you just let it go, um, it, with some de these default settings, you can play with the axial tilt, meteor impact, uh, erosion, you can play with all of these meters, but if you let it go with the defaults, it'll just kind of cyclically uh, go. Um, and so that really is interesting because it creates the ability to toy with the environment uh, and see the impact and play with that and experiment. Um, but what ends up happening is that eventually you have sentience that emerges and the civil, it goes through civilization uh, eras, uh, Stone Age and, and all the way through a nanotech. Um, and so what emerges is kind of a strategic approach where you preserve natural processes and you want to minimize the impacts of the artificial, I call it artificial, but essentially the civilization impacts. Um, and so you go through the cycle 
where you start off with uh, evolution. You can watch the species evolve. Eventually, one for my game, the reptilian uh, species became sentient. And then I see them go through the ages. Uh, and then eventually, the culmination is nanotechnology and the, what calls the exodus. And the exodus is where every, the, the civilization leaves the planet. And then in the lower left-hand corner, they declare it a, a preserve. And then you start all over. You go back through another evolution, and you might evolve again. It might be reptilian. It could be mammalian. When I first played this game as a, I must have been either preteen or teenager, I had mammals emerge first, and then reptiles emerge. And seeing this cycle was really impactful on my my experience. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it's very transhumanist seeing it go through these ages and experiencing this on a, a deep time scale. Um, now the Gaia hypothesis has these different modes, strong, moderate, weak. Um, and the top two um, are, are really more discredited. Um, the Gaia hypothesis is criticized for creating more agency, uh, giving more agency to the biosphere than, than is, is defensible. Um, but there, uh, even its critics acknowledge that it, it does an excellent job modeling, or not modeling, but uh, um, articulating and uh, pointing at the close links between evolution of life and the environment. So last one that I'll talk about here is ECO. And this is right now STEAM Early Access uh, 2020. And ECO is interesting because um, it is really bringing together, uh, it's one of the best that I've seen, at least their, their attempt and their, their, uh, their messaging around it. So here, nature is connected and reactive to human activity, and nature also faces global risks. So nature isn't just in this perfect harmony all the time, and it actually does need stewardship. Um, and so what you then need to do is you, you need to form these, these kind of – need to be mindful of our interactions with nature and see ourselves as beneficiaries and stewards within this environment, interacting with it. So you need to build your civilization. You need to build your – um, your, your, your town and so forth, uh, drawing upon the resources, but they model the um, impacts, the secondary tertiary impacts of that into the, uh, the game as well. And it's interesting, they provide a data layer where all of the, um, the elements to the game have a model behind them or have data that you can go and explore and see the impacts. Um, and so it's a very, very involved game. But ultimately, you need to create sustainable development, and the arc of the game is they, uh, you're essentially the meteor is approaching. And so you need to prepare to develop tools and technologies that can protect the environment from that while using the environment as a resource and dealing with the effects of your, your use of it. So it's a really interesting concept there. Um, lastly, uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what might a Mormon transhumanist ecological frame look like. Um, so we have the transhumanist declaration, and we have the Mormon transhumanist affirmation. And I picked out different phrases out of those where we can start to see ontological, normative, and even strategic uh, ideas. So if we map those here, um, at the ontological level, transhumanist declaration say, says, we recognize that humanity faces serious risks, especially from the misuse of new technologies. There are possible realistic um, scenarios that lead to the loss of most or even all of what we hold valuable. And then at the uh, normative layer, it says you can pick a, pick a phrase like we need, right? That's a thought uh, statement. So we need to carefully deliberate, uh, we need to carefully deliberate how best to reduce risks and expedite beneficial application. And then at the strategic level, as we envision the possibility of broadening human potential by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering, and our confinement to planet Earth. And I like that last phrase there. Remember, we just went through the sim Earth, uh, right, that confinement to planet Earth. And there are some visions of, of transhumanism that sees our, our destiny as ultimately leaving planet Earth. Uh, others see it as rejuvenating planet Earth. And I think we can see both and. Uh, I don't think just that's real quick, you have about one minute yeah. left, Caleb. Okay, great. So moving to the more transhumanist affirmation, it, it uses at the, at the ontological layer, it, it starts with the assumption of the axiom that we believe that scientific knowledge and technological power are among the means ordained of God to enable exaltation. 
And then at the normative layer, it says, we feel a duty to use science and technology according to wisdom and inspiration to identify and prepare for risks and responsibilities associate, associated with future advances. And then at the strategic level, we can point at phrases like, we seek the spiritual and the physical exaltation of individuals and their anatomies, as well as communities and their environments according to their wills, desires, and laws, to the extent they are not oppressive. So we see some of these frames in both the Transhumanist Declaration and the transhumanist affirmation. So this is the last one, and I'll end here. Um, so what, what might, might a, a, a Mormon transhumanist and logical uh, frame look like? Well, scientific knowledge, technological power, or means ordained of God, we saw in the affirmation. And we see this our duty at the normative layer to use science and technology to prepare for risks and responsibilities associated with future advances. And then ultimately, the strategy is spiritual and physical exaltation of individuals, their anatomies, communities, environments, to the extent they are not oppressive. So we get a lot of our frame from that um, affirmation. And I think we can see a lot of our ties to the environment in it, embedded within it. Um, and I guess I'll just end here rhetorically is, you know, what frames can we create, adapt, and utilize in virtual spaces? Um, I don't know if the MTA is positioned to create a video game, but I think we could point to them as, as examples uh, and, and see these as part of our, our overall transhumanist uh, and, and Mormon transhumanist uh, arc. And I guess I'll end there. Thanks.